Okay. Hello, everyone. How are you doing? And welcome to another episode of the Dr. Will Show, where we have the discussions about you becoming the CEO of you. Each week, I bring in a content creator and we discuss ideas and strategies that have actionable steps and you taking ownership over your life. Today, my guest is Whitney L. Barkley. How are you doing, Whitney? Whit Whitney, yes. I'm doing great, Dr. Will. <laughs> I almost called you Whitley. I always called you Whitley. I'm like, That's oh, it's okay. People call me Whitley, Wendy. You'd be surprised at how many people mess up me. <laughs> oh, that's a different world. I'm on this is different. <laughs> Um, so today, you know, we're going to be talking about people, you know, how do you own you and make things move and, 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 and happen in your career? And Whitney came, I wanted her on this show because, you know, she has this podcast. We're going to talk about that later, but it's really awesome. And it's Pink Lemonade podcast, people. Uh, is that an ode to Beyonce? Beyonce kind of inspired it, but I just wanted to add my own little twist to it. I love the color pink, so I just I thought it made sense. <laughs> okay, okay. So it's, it's awesome because the information you have in there is really uh, empowering, and it's to the point, and it's not... Uh, some stuff I listen... You know, some people out there, you know, like... Uh, that dude Cardone, he'll pump you up with his little 10 times. And, you know, Gary V will do stuff too. Now, Gary V cuss too much. So I can only take him in little smidgets. <laughs> uh, but some people talk about stuff and they really, to me, they, they're talking to a different type of, of person or a crowd. But it's not, I don't feel like, oh, they're talking to the, the everyday man to get him, him or her to move forward. And when I listen to your podcast and then, you know, going to your, the, your blog, I'm like, okay, this is speaking to me in a way that's a little different. It, it, it's, it's getting me motivated and ready to go ahead and take that next step. So that's why I wanted to have you on the show. Well, thank you. Well, you're welcome. You're welcome. So for those who will be watching or will listen to this podcast. Will you please introduce yourself? All right. Well, my name is Whitney O. Barkley. I'm based here in Columbus, Ohio, and I am essentially a content creator. So I come in two different folds. One, the one that you were referring to is the Skinny Black Girls Code. That is a platform that I created to help people feel confident and free. I started it in 2014, and it started with the mission of body positivity. So I start from looking back from where I came from. I was someone who grew up, and I was often and tease for my body size. So as I was teased, that's something that translated into my adult life. But then when I really started to peel back the layers, I realized that it was something much more, you know, self-confidence is much more than how you look or what your outer appearance is. So essentially when I began the Skinny Black Girls Code, I started to understand what things bother people. People had self-doubt. People didn't believe in themselves. Um, and ultimately people weren't living the best life. So I created the platform to motivate people to live literally the best, live, literally live to be the kind of the best versions of themselves. So um, that is one thing. <laughs> but, you know, as we talk, you'll see that my background varies. I've done a multitude of things. And as you said, your theme is about owning your career. So I'm one of those people who I'm not scared to try different things. I'm not scared to try things that will allow me to grow because I believe that, you know, everything that we do is by no accident. Everything that I've literally done has prepared me for the next experience. And so that's something that I'm hoping to emphasize today. Mm. Okay, y'all. We haven't even really started yet. I'm ready. <laughs> uh, so you mentioned the, the skinny, oh, skinny black girls cold. Can't mess this up. This, Don't uh, feel bad. My dad just finally said it right for the first time yesterday. <laughs> 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 so it's okay. So what is the skinny black girls cold, and what is the work that speaks to your soul? Okay, so the Skinny Black Girls Code is a blog. As I mentioned before, I started it in 2014. So I started it actually when I was working. So in 2014, I was 24 years old and I was the first director of marketing at a nonprofit in Cincinnati where I lived formerly. So that was a big position for me. 
So I remember one day being in a meeting and in the meeting, I had like prepared this great presentation, was ready to go. And uh, someone made a comment about my body. And, you know, it was something that everyone laughed about. Everyone was like, oh, you know, he ha ha. They thought it was really funny. But I'm like, man, you know, like this was something that bothered me. So it motivated me to start something. So the Skinny Black Girls Code essentially is a multimedia platform. So we do blogs, the podcast and videos. And those things are are essentially created as kind of like a self-help website. So you're, when you come to the Skinny Black Girls Code, I'm hoping that when you come, you leave a totally different person. So, you know, again, like we live in this world now where everything is carefully curated, right? We go down a Twitter timeline and, you know, people choose to show you what they want you to see about their lives. But really, I want to make sure that people see the real deal. Like I'm someone, I try to be transparent and I use the Skinny Black Girls Code as a platform to find other women who are willing to be transparent and allow you to kind of see the behind the scenes of their life instead of just those highlight reels. Mm. And that's the cool thing about it because, you know, with Instagram and, and Facebook and other things, particularly Instagram where, people will show these pictures and, and you're like, Oh, you know, wow. They're living the life and they're, they're mm -hmm. bottles. And they're doing all these things. You know, people get caught up in, they are 20 steps ahead of, of my, of where I am, or I have yet to accomplish where I want to be. Something's wrong with me. Cause they keep comparing mm -hmm. their day to someone else's, tomorrow and quite honestly the, the crazy part about it is what you see in that picture that person could be fake all together but you mm -hmm. know get so bombarded with all these messages that we don't even just sit down and say okay i'm alive i'm breathing i still mm -hmm. got time to make this happen you know mm -hmm. i just need to put in the work uh, so when you talk about you know, people actually getting out there and sharing and, and doing it. I, I love it uh, because one of the things that I, I love to talk about, I, I even tell the kids at school, you got to put in the work, mm -hmm. you know, you got to put in the work and it's so amazing. People just go, go to the blog and see the different stories and there are different women there. You know, I'm not skinny or a black girl, but I enjoy <laughs> the blog myself. Uh, so it's really awesome. Now, you know, from the time that we're young, you know, we're told to go to school. We're told mm -hmm. to get a college degree, go get that good job with those benefits. And that's the key to success. But the world of work has changed. You know, digital has and continues to have an impact on every industry. Where do you see digital disrupting tradition, the, the traditional career ladder, and how should professionals go about navigating the social media landscape? So that is a great question. Um, as a millennial who's kind of lived through this digital disruption, I can kind of totally comment on that. So just in my own personal experience, you know, I, like you said, everyone has always told you, you know, go to college, get a good job, go work for someone else. And, you know, and that had always been my mentality for a multitude of years. And so, you know, literally that same year when I was 24, um, I realized that I didn't have to follow a traditional landscape. So digital allows you to I essentially think that digital allows you to manage your own brand. So, you know, you're not restrained or you're not constricted to what people think about you kind of in your own space. On social media, you can project yourself to be anyone who you want to be. You know, I teach at the Ohio Media School here in Columbus, and I have students who will come in, and maybe they work as a uh, customer service representative in a call center, or they work in a factory. And so when it comes to creating LinkedIn pages, right, they're like, well, you know, I'm not this media person yet. You know, I, I need to put that I work in a factory, or I need to put that I work in customer service. And I'm like, no, you don't. You project the image that you want people to see. True enough, you know, this is what you're doing. This is your experience. But you get to ultimately control your narrative online. So I think that is what digital has helped us be able to do. You know, you're not put into a box, especially, you know, if people think that that's all you're going to do within your life. So 
I think digital helps us um, in terms of getting rid of that traditional career path because A, it allows you to stand out so you can get on any platform that you want to and then you can connect with anybody who you want to. Because we have the internet, because we have social media, you're able to connect to people that you probably would have never even have met otherwise. Um, but in the same breath, um, you know, digital also has its disadvantages, you know, because now that everyone has the same opportunity, there's a lot more competition. So, you know, you have to understand how you can brand yourself to make sure you're standing out from that competition. Um, you know, just even in specific work experiences, I used to work as a career coach in Cincinnati for a nonprofit organization. And during my time, I would meet people who have been working for 30 years and maybe they had been laid off from a job. And, you know, coming out of a, into a job market after 30 years, you know, they're used to just doing a paper application and going in and getting a job the same day. And it doesn't work like that anymore. So, you know, you have to understand that, you know, with this digital disruption, you can't think the same way that you've thought before. You have to adapt, and that's the most important thing right now. I think as someone who's trying to pursue their career, you have to be ready to adapt to whatever changes that digital media brings, because you want to be a part of that change, so ultimately people can see you and you're a magnet for opportunity. Mm -hmm. So I want to throw this out there to you. So when you talk about using digital and, and social to position yourself and craft your brand how does one just sit down and and let's just say okay hey you know i sell insurance mm -hmm. but i see myself getting to this certain level in my field or maybe i want to transition how do they then get on social media and start creating that image that will tell the story that they want others to see? So I think first it starts with knowing yourself. Um, I think that's the most essential thing. A lot of times people will go online and they'll try to brand themselves and they don't have success because people don't know exactly what it is that they do. So the first thing I think is understanding who you are just in terms of what your strengths are. I would say the next thing that you essentially would wanna do is to start to look for other people who are in your field who are doing what you want to do. Look at how they're branding themselves. And, you know, not to say that you should copy, but figure out what are some of the characteristics that you should mirror within your online presence. I also think that when it comes to branding yourself, and especially becoming a content creator, like, that's a question that I get a lot of times from my students. They'll say, well, Miss Whitney, you know, like, what content should I put out? How do I define content? You have to look within the things that you do. So, for example, if you know that you are, let's say, for example, a financial expert, right? You know, think about those things that you do with your clients. So if your clients always have frequently asked questions, you can feature a question of the day that you always get from one of your clients. Or, you know, you can explain a concept that you know that people um, typically don't understand. So, you know, you have to think about the content is within the things that you do on an everyday basis. It's just kind of up to you to identify what your target audience is actually going to like. Um, and then I will also say the biggest thing, too, is figuring out which platforms are right for you. Now, there's two different ways to look at it. A lot of times people will say, well, I don't like Facebook because I don't want to get on it. And that may be fine, but your target audience may be on Facebook. So you kind of have to understand um, what you're comfortable using first, and then is your target audience there? So if your target audience is not there, you might have to get out of your comfort zone and figure out where they are so you can meet them halfway. So I think those are um, really some of the things that you should consider to think about when you want to start to manage your, your social media presence. And then for those you know who are in a traditional nine to five, um, I really think it's important, and I've, I've lived by this um, forever, but I really think it's important to make sure that you have a brand outside of your employer. I think that is so important. Um, and the reason I say that is because, you know, a lot of times people are defined by their jobs, but, you know, let's say for whatever reason you lose a job or something happens to your job, then what happens to you? At least if you have an ongoing brand, you know, you are still that magnet for opportunity. And, you know, there are some employers who love people who have their own brand because if you have a great personal brand, that's a great reflection of that employer. You're bringing people or bringing visibility back to them. So I would definitely say for those who are in that traditional career landscape, make sure you're cultivating your personal brand. Wow. And that's so true. I tell people all the time, sometimes people say, because I've told teachers at, at school now, 
if there are certain people at the district who who emails me after a certain time or doing the weekend, okay, I'll put in the work. But on average, I'm not. When I go home, I'm I'm building my dream. Mm-hmm. I'm working on other pursuits that I have. I'm working on my podcast. I'm working on those blog posts that I write for pay somewhere else. Notice I said for pay people. Um, <laughs> but I do that because I have to prepare myself for that next opportunity. Whether I stay with the district for another 30 years, another 15 years, another five, I am in this thing to make sure that I am preparing myself for whatever may, may happen. Uh, great place, great people. But I also need to understand that, you know, brother got a roof and some renovations he want to do. And I got to start bringing in multiple streams of income. And so mm-hmm. building, building that brands, creating those opportunities is something that I do. And I impress upon anyone else out there to do the same. Yes, I totally agree. <laughs> so you recently did a blog post on the truth of recurring fears and how to crush them. A lot of people, myself included, put off taking a leap into something, right? So I want to get into online education. And I'm sitting here going like, all right. Because I'm not, there's a field that I've never worked in. Now, what I have done, I went ahead and took the leap and registered for a course from a university so I can get my certification in teaching online because I know that's where I want to be. But it took me some time to get there because I was like, those are not skills I have right now. Uh, I know what I know now, you know, but to go there, I was like, ooh, I don't know, I don't know. How do people, and you know, because you spend so much time, you just doubt, you doubt yourself, you know? Mm -hmm. And you wonder if your dreams are too big or if what you want is something you can actually have. So where does this mindset come from? And how do people go beyond the self-doubt and the fear of not being ready? So I think when it comes to having big dreams, if they scare you, you're in the right direction. I I think your dreams should be so big that they should scare you in a healthy way. Um, I think with anything that you do new, there's a natural feeling of fear because you haven't done it before. But the biggest thing that I would say for those who have that fear mindset, the first thing you got to get over yourself, because if you have that thought, like if you have the thought that you can do something, like I feel like you're meant to do it because even if it doesn't work out, there's still a lesson in what it is that you've done. So even if it didn't work out, you know that you can move on to the next thing. There's no lingering. What if? So I think that is the, the most thing that is important. I mean, like even for me, um, when I lived in Cincinnati, I left a full-time job. I had a great job. I left full-time, my full-time job to pursue entrepreneurship. Yes, I was scared. Um, my father had done that in my family. Like, he had done entrepreneurship. And I remember for years, I would say, oh, I'm, I'm not going to be an entrepreneur. This is too stressful. I saw him on the phone all the time, stressed out. I'm like, nope, this isn't for me. I'm going to graduate from college, go get my corporate job, and live happily ever after. But it wasn't like that. So, you know, I gravitated towards entrepreneurship. And I had a natural fear. But at the same time, I knew it was something that I wanted to do. And my first business, I owned a business called The Barter Base. My business essentially failed that first time. But you know, there were so many lessons within that first business that I learned that with this second business, I mean, I've, you know, skyrocketed into the level that I knew that I could go to. But it took for me to do something in the beginning and for me to fail to understand how I can get to that next level. So I think, you know, we have to understand that essentially we do have to get over ourselves and and just kind of not be afraid to take that next step. I mean, granted, you will be afraid, but you you just kind of have to execute anyway. There's a, 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 a quote that I love is, feel the fear and do it anyway. Like you literally just have to do it anyway. Cause otherwise, if you don't do it, it you'll always just be wondering about it. And you, you never want to wonder. You want to go to sleep at night knowing that you've done everything that you can do to live the best life that you can live. Mm. I just had to do it. Uh, I have no idea what's going to happen, but I've already paid for the course since it starts next month. Oh, yeah. So you, so you got to do it. That's <laughs> a start. And sometimes you got to 
sometimes it, and sometimes you just gotta put yourself out there. Like even um, when I wrote my book, you know, I was like, man, I'm gonna write a book. And like, I had designed a cover and everything for myself. And I was like, you know what? I just put it on Facebook, like come in September, 2017. And once I put it out there, people are like, oh, I can't wait to buy it. So now people have this expectation. So you kind of have to give yourself a kick. Like for me, if I put it out on social media, I have to do it, you know, because I, I want to follow through with everything that I say that I'm going to do. So that's one way that I kind of kick some of my fear. Like I put it out there just to make sure that I do actually do it. Because I know there are people who will hold me accountable for it. Mm. So how do people create a plan? Because they, you know, they'll hear you just say feel it go for it mm -hmm. or they may hear oprah some other folks out there who will just say hey you you got you know life is grand and you got to go out here and chase your dreams and all of those things and in their minds some people are like oh, well that's oprah that's not me or or look Whitney the l barkley Look at what she's doing online. She's just balling out. That's not me. How do they, I, I guess, begin that process? I mean, I know mentally at some point you just have to get over that hurdle of take the first step. Mm -hmm. But sort of how do they, whether it's a, a journal or getting an accountability partner or a, a, like you did with the book cover or whatever, you just put it on there and say it's coming out. To where people are now saying, hey, I want this. What steps should people take to make sure that they are actually making moves? And how can they seek help? Or what kind of help should they seek to make sure that they actually follow through? Okay. So I think there's a couple of different things that would help uh, for people who may have everything in their head, but they don't know how to exactly execute. I mean, because writing it down and putting it into a plan is one thing, but I think execution is kind of where people fall as short as I usually see. So for me, um, I will always recommend starting with research. That's the most important thing. So a lot of times people will say, well, you know, I want to start a business and they'll have this idea of starting a business but they don't really take the steps to really figure out how they should start that business. For me, research eases a lot of my concerns. Like if I go and get the right information from reputable sources, you know, say like a chamber of commerce, you know, I don't know about um, where you live in Mississippi, but in Columbus, we have a multitude of different chambers. Uh, we have the Women's Business Center. Uh, we have a few like startup companies who help people start up their, or excuse me, accelerators who help people start up their businesses. So, you know, going to those and accessing some of those free resources, right? So that's, that's one thing. Um, what I've learned in the beginning, especially when starting a dream, a lot of times uh, people will want to start, but they'll invest so much initially, and it may not even be something that they want to do. So I would definitely say at first, take advantage of some of the free resources. Now, in terms of writing it down, um, I would say start from the end goal and work your way backwards. So let's say your goal is to make $100,000, right? Let's say your goal is to make $100,000. So you, if you know you want to make $100,000, think of all the different ways that you would need to create a, an income of $100,000. Then break it down by month. How much? Then break it down by day. So by day, you probably need to make around $274 every day to reach $100,000. So you kind of have to think, um, you have to become process oriented in your thought process. And I always tell people just to start from your goal and then work your way backwards. And then two, um, and just in terms of accountability, accountability partners are great. Um, I've found that a lot of times there are people who may not have the right support systems around them, you know, say, um, fortunately, we have the internet, and that's a great place to start. I know personally for me, when I first started entrepreneurship, I went on Facebook, went through a a ton of different groups for people who were willing and ready to share with you about some of their experiences and are open to asking questions. So, you know, I would definitely start. And then if you do have some people who are around you who may not necessarily have the same idea, but, you know, are equally motivated in their intent, create a mastermind. A mastermind is one of the greatest things that you can do um, because you're around like-minded people who will push you and encourage you to move forward. Mm. I like that. I like that. Now, 
you mentioned it earlier, and behind you, I've been staring at this cover. What is your book about? <laughs> so the Skinny Black Girl's Guide to Freedom. Um, really, it's a book about how I achieve personal freedom in my life. So essentially, it's about um, just going back from when I was a teenager up until maybe I was about 25 years old-ish, and just kind of talking about just things that I've been through personally and how I've been able to achieve a level of personal freedom. So it's really def defining what freedom is, how you can get it, and how to actually maintain it. Because what I've learned is freedom is not a destination. It's a journey, and it's something that you're going to go through, through for everything. So, you're, you know, once you find that freedom, don't think that nothing else is going to come through and disrupt it. I mean, because we all have challenges that will disrupt our peace of mind or how we think. So I just want people to kind of create a thick skin and understand how they can continue to find freedom, even if they come through, through different obstacles. Mm. So you're an author, serial entrepreneur, content creator. Why then do you create a podcast? Well, I create a podcast because, I mean, I've, my background is in media. I look at it. I study it. And, you know, blogging has been around forever, right? But I've noticed that, you know, within the last three to four years, podcasts have exploded. You know, people would rather listen or watch something versus actually sit and read something because we, we naturally process images a lot faster just as well as we process audio a lot faster. So I'm like, well, if I, you know, I'm going to continue to do what I'm doing, I need to get with the times and create a podcast so pink lemonade was essentially born um just because i know my audience and i know where people were going now um pink lemonade i wanted to give a different perspective because on my blog i focused mostly on interviewing other people and understanding their ways of life but i wanted to take a different approach and come from my personal perspective so you know in terms of the topics that i cover just really focusing on personal development and growth because I believe that, you know, your brand can't be 100% until you are 100%. I don't care what it is that you do until you feel good and feel like, you know, until you feel very good about yourself, you really can't give 100% effort to any of your endeavors. So that is essentially why I created Pink Lemonade. I wanted to create a bite-sized podcast that people can listen to on the go, something that wasn't too long, and something that will allow them to self-reflect and just ultimately think about how they can become better people. And it's nice, people. It's nice. I, I've been listening to it and the different things. Uh, when you, I didn't know what to think when I saw the the layaway uh, episode that popped up. <laughs> <laughs> that was my favorite. That was actually my favorite one. I really enjoyed doing that. I mean, just because I like, I'm a nerd naturally. Like, I like to do research. I like to figure out the root of things and tying it to, like, life. So that was literally my favorite one. <laughs> That's awesome. So uh, well, what, where do your ideas come from? Are your shows pre-planned or does something sort of happen in your life where you notice something online and you say, I'm going to tackle that next? Well, it's a combination of several different things. Uh, when I first started the podcast, it was more sporadic. So it was more so based on what I felt at the time. So uh, the last several episodes are definitely pre-planned. Um, I definitely took the time out to create the content. I actually created content all the way through the rest of this year. So I know pretty much everything that I want to talk about for the rest of the year, unless, you know, of course, something happens that is trending or something that I feel like I need to be a part of. But um, yeah, I pretty much try to plan the content and I plan it by, you know, just asking people in my audience, asking them what exactly do they want to hear. Um, you know, I usually refer to social media a lot. Like if I see a certain theme happening a lot of times, then I try to write those things down as well. So um, that is essentially what I've been doing just to get it out there. <laughs> so you, you talked about this and now you have your you have your blog, you have your podcast. You are a true content creator. I had to get in this game because I asked a friend who is killing it in the consulting game. I said, hey man, how can I get to your level? He said, 
you need to create content. Mm -hmm. And I did not want to write a blog because I knew that that content had to be consistent to build that audience. So I said, hmm. I had dabbled in podcasting in a previous job. And I said, I, I like this thing. So that's, mm -hmm. like, that's, that's where I'm going to go. And that's where sort of the genesis of my show came from and why. And now I love it, though. I'm just a junkie. <laughs> I listen to podcasts all the time. With, and then, you know, with my show, I'm always trying to get, get better. And season four has a new direction. So I brought this up to get to this question. How important is it for people to become content creators? Well, well, Dr. Will, I remember two years ago, I attended a conference in New York City called Tech 808. Um, the conference is no longer in existence, but it was a great event that combined hip hop and entrepreneurship and technology. It was like an emergence of everything. So Tristan Walker happened to be there. He's the owner of Bevel. And he asked the audience if we were okay with being consumers and not producers. And literally that question changed my life because you have to realize that every day we consume so much from other people and those people, you know, they're brave because they're taking the leap to express their voice, start a business, whatever. And, you know, and we're buying into the things that they're doing. And for me, I think it's critical for people to become content creators because content creation is literally survival to me in this day and age, especially if you're someone who is ambitious and want to have a career because the internet allows us to share, you know, just information, thoughts, and opinions, it allows you to have that freedom to express yourself and your ideas. And I believe that when you believe in your ideas and when you actually share them with the world, you have no idea the type of chain reaction that you can bring to other people. You know, because you created something, people get inspired and they might create something that could change the world. You know, you never know. And, you know, I always say that, you know, it's kind of selfish for us not to share our gifts with the world. And I think content creation is that medium that allows us to share so we can inspire other people. Mm. So I'm going to throw this out, out there to your, throw that out, throw this out there to you. Because this is something that I ask people when we talk about content creation. Do you Google yourself? Absolutely. I just did it the other day because I did it as an activity with my class. So we always, I always did that where they Google themselves when we first start. <laughs> so I do that pretty regularly. Um, I also use Google alerts too, as well, just so that if my name ever pops up in the search engine, it at least sends me an email to let me know like, Hey, you're on Google. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. And, and I do this, you know, last year and it's, and it's, so odd how certain things resonate with people. But last year I was given a, a talk to parents on digital uh, citizenship uh, at this parent night we had. And I asked the question, do you Google yourself? And part of it mm -hmm. was me telling people that you need to get out there and create content because the problem is when you don't create content, when someone Googles your name, you are at the mercy of whatever is out there. Mm -hmm. But when you are blogging, when you are vlogging, when you are making videos or you have a podcast, that content starts to creep up. Mm -hmm. that search engine. If you're making videos, because video is one of those things that Google really loves. Mm -hmm. And you start to create that narrative of who you are, what you are, and what you have to offer. And, you know, I also tell people, holler at your friends and tell them, don't tag you. And stuff. <laughs> uh, because that's I why agree. I tell people, yeah, you know, something can pop up and go, ooh, mm -mm, your boss might not care about that, but mine may. Uh, mm -hmm. So untag me from that Facebook photo. But it's one of those things I tell people you must create content because you have to, at this day and age, think of yourself as a brand, own your brand, and actually put in the work to where your brand is something that is beneficial to you. Yes. I totally agree. You know, it's funny. Um, I always ask my students if they think it's important if they are not on a search engine, like, you know, if, if I were not able to find you, 
you know, is, is that a bad thing? And a lot of times they'll say, oh, you know, well, that's a good thing. And I'm like, well, no, um, especially if you have a common name, right? So my, my maiden name is Whitney White. You know how many Whitney Whites there are in the world? <laughs> so if you Google Whitney White, as you can imagine, you'll probably see a lot of different people and a lot of other content. So that's why it's so important to produce that content so you can differentiate yourself and to make sure, again, like what you're saying, you're able to control that narrative about yourself. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I love it. And that's one of the things we're going to be talking about in this show in upcoming episodes as we move forward is the importance of becoming a content creator. Just as so certain businesses who would have never thought of themselves as a technology company are now realizing we got to be in the tech game. Mm -hmm. People need to understand that you need to be into the, be into the content creation game. Uh, so before we go, I want to bring up how you know 50 percent of educators are just rolling out they're just leaving the profession mm -hmm. you know i talk to educators and they're overwhelmed right they there's testing there's students their administrators their parents they're just they're, they're beat down and they're ready to go what is your call to action for teachers or anyone else who may listen to this podcast and they feel stuck, like their life is at a standstill and they don't know what to do. Wow. So first and foremost, you know, I always commend anyone who's a teacher as someone who's, you know, teaches myself, I know that it's an incredible responsibility and it is something that um, it can definitely be a thankless job <laughs> for sure, but I definitely can understand the desire to lead the profession. So I know you referenced kind of that K through 12 crowd, but I work both in both a career school environment and in a traditional college. So I've seen some of those same frustrations, um, even just at a higher level. So for me, I would definitely say that my call to action is to remember your why. So many people become educators because they want to see the next generation succeed and ultimately flourish. So I believe that educators should essentially focus on those who they can help and give them their all. So, you know, my first year of teaching, like, you know, I wanted to just be like this all-star teacher. I wanted to like make everyone know what I knew, but you have to understand that when it comes to learning, everyone is capable of learning, but the willing part is the hard part, right? You know, if you're not willing to learn, then you won't be able to absorb everything that an educator has to offer you. So um, I had to learn the hard way that, you know, I won't be able to give everyone what I have. Everyone's not gonna have the same passion or enthusiasm that I have for my subject. Um, you know, everyone doesn't come from my same walk of life or have the same mentality that I had when I was a student. But the people who do, those are the ones you give everything and that's all that matters. So I feel like educators have to have that mentality that I, even if they only reach a few, they've served their purpose. Mm. Okay. That's, you know, that's, that's, that's interesting because I don't know what I was expecting, but I don't know if I was expecting that. Um, because I, I don't know the answer to give, you know, them when, when, because teaching like nursing and social work and, and let's say be, becoming a doctor, they all have the same sort of career path of you go to school and it leads you straight into that job. Mm -hmm. And when you, especially if you have been like, oh, I've always wanted to be a teacher and you go to school and you pass your tests and you, your student teaching and finally you're in the classroom and you're like this is a nightmare get me out of here <laughs> <laughs> like wh what do you do because you you have put so much time and energy into this and you had this this dream this 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 idea of this is what this is going to be like and now mm -hmm. it is like what am i in the sunken place like this doesn't make any <laughs> It doesn't make any sense. Or you're that veteran teacher that you have seen, like you loved it. Okay. You, you would tell people they're going to have to drag me out of that school. I love teaching. But now with testing and other things that are going on, 
you're like, man, I'm ready to be done with this, this place, man. I'm, <laughs> woo, I'm like, let me play the lotto because I'm just trying to get about this bad boy. I don't know what to tell people who they're fed up. You know, how, mm -hmm. how, do, you, how do they be become inspired again to either do the work or seek out different work that sort of reignites their reason. Who they are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I, no, I can totally understand that. Um, I think it kind of goes back to the point we made earlier about, you know, make sure that you have something. <laughs> I mean, I understand like maintaining your brand, but even outside of teaching, making sure that you have something that keeps you inspired. Cause like I've been in a situation before where I've done you know, a certain kind of work and I felt drained, but when I had something else, it kind of reinvigorated me to do the main thing that I was doing. So I definitely think that, um, you know, finding that creative outlet can help. And if, you know, if that doesn't help, then that may not still be the right profession for them. But, you know, again, I can understand the feelings of being stuck and not feeling like, you know, you want to be in a certain position. I mean, because, I mean, that happens to me. That still happens to me until this day. But when I come across someone, a student who's highly motivated, and they just get it, they take it, like, I, to me, everything is worth it after that. <laughs> <laughs> it's totally worth it. That's all, I mean, for me, that that's all I need. All I need is one, and then none of the other stuff matters to me. That's all right, y'all. She's like, nah, so all she needs is one. <laughs> oh, the Nas people. One mic, one mic. Uh, thank you, Whitney L. Barkley, for being a guest on the show. I had a great conversation. Thank you. No, I appreciate it. This is wonderful. I totally love being here. <laughs> You well, you thank you, thank you, thank you so much. I'm, I, you know, I'm still shocked. I'm four years in, and I'm still shocked that people say yes uh, because they don't know me. Essentially, I'm on Twitter or LinkedIn, reaching out to strangers. Like we may have had conversations, you know, on these platforms, but these people don't know me. Mm -hmm. And people, and people like yourself, say, "Yeah, I'll do it," and I'm like, "All right." <laughs> you know, so, that's that's the way of the world now <laughs> why not you know you, you never know you just never know what happens or what may transpire so i'm i'm always open to opportunity and i'm just always open to share too because again if if i have information that can help somebody else why not yes yes people you know how i do this the video cast is going up on youtube I need you to look at that. Subscribe. Leave a brother a message. A brother trying to get Oprah on the show, people. I need my numbers up. <laughs> All right. This is going up on SoundCloud and iTunes. Leave a review. Share it with everybody you know. Okay. Tell them. Go check it out. Twitter, LinkedIn, I'm sharing all of this out so people can go. There's going to be ways and information so you can get in contact with Whitney as well. So people, thank you for checking out the podcast. Thank you for allowing me to make it to season four. As always, people, invest in you, EDU, peace.